Good morning, church family. It's Phil Pearson here, um, missing everybody. But today I've been asked to share about uh, how I pray. And I must admit that initially there was a bit of fear with sharing because, um, quite honestly, you know, prayer has been a struggle for me um, in recent times. And when you're a person who's um, up front leading worship, um, been part of the church for your entire life, um, you know, there's, there's a bit of a fear of um, showing your true, what you see as your true self, your flawed self. And so um, I was asked quite a few weeks ago, and I've probably been uh, dawdling a bit in getting something done, but what this prayer course has done for me is helped me to realize um, that prayer life is different for everybody. And the probably the, the main thing, the best thing out of this course for me has it's reconnected me with those things um, from my prayer life that are truly valuable to me and that are the most meaningful in my relationship with God. So they're the things I want to share with you today that I've done uh, and that I'm doing more of um, to build that relationship and communion with God. So there's three things that I usually do for prayer. Um, the first thing uh, is I use music, uh, and I know some others have as well. The second thing is I use the Lord's Prayer uh, as well. And finally, writing is a really um, meaningful way for me to pray that I've really um, just recently picked up again. And that's, again, a credit to this prayer course we've been journeying through. So for music... Um, whether it be praise and worship music, whether it be listening to my favourite Christian artist, I get a real sense of, um, of focus on God when I'm listening to the melodies, listening to the lyrics. And I just find that in the middle of whether it's, pray, whether it's praising with, with the songs and, or whether it's just listening, um, I often find myself focusing on a single lyric and that will then bring about a small prayer um, and just really using that time to connect with God uh, in, a, in what feels for me to be a deep way, um, in, a, in an honest way, in a, an open way. Um, and so music is really, really important for my prayer journey. Um, the second thing is the Lord's Prayer. I often will uh, sit down and think about, well, what am I going to pray about? Um, and sometimes the words don't come easily. So in those instances, then I will often just think through um, the Lord's Prayer and let the words and the themes of the Lord's Prayer guide my prayer, whether that be adoration, whether that be confession, uh, whether that be um, asking for God's will to be done in various parts of my life. The Lord's Prayer has been really helpful in focusing my prayer where other times I may not know um, or have anything immediately coming to mind as to what I want to bring to God at that time. Finally, uh, writing. Uh, now, writing is something that I used to do a lot when I was younger, when I was a teenager. Um, I had a little journals that I kept. And uh, at times, uh, Kate has, has purchased little journals for me to use, um, knowing that that, is a va that was a valuable thing for me to do. But it's something I haven't done in a number of years. And what this prayer course has flagged for me and highlighted for me and is that you know we all talk to God and we all commune with God in our own ways, and He speaks our language. And that has reignited... Um, my uh, passion for, for writing and reconnecting uh, to the point where I now have two new journals that I am um, starting up um, and that would not have happened without this prayer course. Uh, so I really encourage you um, to find those things that are most meaningful to you and the most natural to you in your relationship with God. I've had times where I've gone, I'm not doing this well, why isn't this working for me? Um, and I've really come to realize that what is meaningful, what is right, is what is true and uh, an honest reflection of who I am and, um, and how 
those things that are most meaningful to me in my relationship with God, not necessarily what other people might be doing, um, even though there are so many valuable things out there. But I gain the most connection with God and my prayer time is most meaningful when I'm focusing on those three things of music, the Lord's Prayer and writing. Blessings to you all. Greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done in this city. You're the God of this city. You're the king of this people, you're the lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless. Hi church family, well it's nearly August, we are mid lockdown 2.0 and we are all experiencing this time in very different ways, this unexpected year of 2020. Some of you are finding so much more time and space in this time and even enjoying this time to some degree but others, many, are finding it a challenge at so many levels. All of us find our hope and our strength in this time in Jesus. So we thought, what a better idea than to invite all of us in this moment, uh, late July, early August, to pick up the phone um, and call someone in our church community just to say hello. We're calling it Let's Stay Connected in COVID. Um, and as we've learning about, we've been learning about in Willie Church Online, God wants to speak to us and we really can listen to him. So why not take a moment now um, in your day and just to pause and ask God, is there a person? Is there maybe two or three? Maybe there is even more uh, people in our church community uh, who God is placing on my heart, in my mind, to phone this coming week. Um, just to say hi, uh, just to see how they're going and to touch base. Wouldn't it be amazing if over the next couple of weeks, we saw phone calls happening across our church community with the simple um, goal of seeing people connect with one another and just be asking the question, how are you going in this time? So now it's over to you. We may be physically distanced, but we can be relationally and spiritually closer than ever in this time. Good morning, everyone. Jono has asked me to um, lead us all in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, Lord, our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hi Church, it's good to be with you again on this Sunday morning. I've been asked to speak a little bit about spiritual warfare and prayer. Now this season that we've been going through looking into prayer, this is just so good, both personally and as a community. We're praying for people, we're interceding for our city at this, particularly at this time. 
Uh, we're also asking God to speak to us individually. We're asking God to grow us and, and help us to be deeper and more rooted in him and his word. This is good stuff. However, when the church begins to move this way, our enemy sort of looks, goes, hmm, what's going on here? Now, our enemy, is that Satan? Is that the devil himself? Well, not so much. But principalities and powers are an evil force that are a personality. Uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not talking human beings. We're talking spiritual beings who their job is to work against the church. So I'd like to read something out of Colossians where we're warned against being deceived by our, our enemy. Let's read this in Colossians chapter 2. Beware lest anyone should cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of man, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And as you are complete in him, who is the head of all principalities and power. Now, verse 15, check this out. It says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Jesus is triumphant over evil. However, evil is still working against us and particularly in our prayer life. How does this evil work? That word deceit. You know, the Bible is quite funny. I did a little word study of the word deceive in the New Testament. And it's interesting. There's two kinds of deceit. First kind, when we deceive ourselves. Apparently, us human beings are silly enough that we can deceive ourselves. And I guess we've all been down that road. But then there is deception that comes because of principalities and powers, because of evil, just because of deception. This is the way the devil wants to trick us up, particularly in our prayer life where we believe God's speaking to us, but is it right? Is that word? We've got to check that word because it could be the enemy working against us. I want to show you how deception works. Years ago, this is a little secret story. Years ago in 1974, the whole Bruce Lee thing was enormous, you know, martial arts, kung fu. And as a young 16 year old, I just jumped into it. I joined a kung fu class. And uh, it was all a brand new class that had only just opened. Kung Fu had never been heard of until then. And so I joined this class. And of course, we were learning all these moves together as a group. There's about 30 of us. And we were learning and kind of going through all the training at the same thing. But then we, were, we would come together and do competition spas. And me being super competitive, I, I kind of realized that if I could trick the people in the, that I'm fighting into thinking I'm going one way, but then going the other, I could win spars. Let me show you an example. One of the things we learned was a, uh, a side kick. You put a foot at the back and you just come up and kick. So it's really easy to spot. You, you jump in, you do that and you come up and kick. You, you would have seen this. It's just a simple move. But what I did is I've worked out, aha, if I go like that, they're going to think I'm coming up with my foot, jump around the top and hit him in the head. With it. And it worked. Stupid, simple little trick of moving my foot in one way. They immediately put their attention on that. And then I come over and knock them on the head. Do you know, I actually, as a white belt, I was green. I won a competition against a brown belt, which is right up there near black. He was not happy at all. But it was all because I learned little tricks of deception. And that is how the enemy works against us. Little tricks of deception. How do you not be deceived? By the word of God, by understanding that Christ has disarmed principalities and powers and understanding that through our character, through the, the fullness of Christ in us, through the Holy Spirit, by knowing the word. Remember when Christ was tempted in the wilderness? How did he work against that temptation directly from Satan himself? The word of God. Study the word of God. Learn the word of God. Pray the word of God. Be aware. And if you are aware, God will speak to you very clearly um, about what he is saying and reveal to you clearly what he is not saying and what some other voice might be saying. I hope this has been helpful and uh, I look forward to these weeks continuing in our massive time of prayer. Amen.
Well, Pete, here we are. This is the final session of the prayer course. Incredible. And it's been an amazing journey, hasn't it? We've yeah. covered a lot of ground. We really, really have. Um, but I know that there's still one more important topic. There is. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the opposition that we face as Christians. And I know that as soon as we start talking about Satan and demons, there's going to be a lot of people that think that sounds crazy mm -hmm. or that it sounds like some sort of like second rate Marvel movie. Mm -hmm. But I know for you that this session is actually one of the most important of the prayer course. Can you tell us why? Yeah, I think if you don't understand spiritual warfare, you don't really understand prayer. Mm -hmm. And the Bible is 100% clear that we are in a spiritual battle. There is an active enemy. Jesus himself launched his whole ministry with 40 days of spiritual warfare mm -hmm. in the wilderness. Right. And then the, the Apostle Peter, he says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The Apostle Paul says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities mm. and powers in high places. So spiritual battle is it's a biblical reality. Well, where I live in Ibiza, we definitely get to see the dark side of that as well. Yeah, I can imagine that. And, and of course, it's not just Ibiza, where maybe sometimes it might seem more obvious. Every time you pick up a newspaper, actually probably anywhere in the world, there are stories of war, of genocide, of human trafficking, just terrible things that humans do to humans. And it's not just out there, it's in here. We when we're really honest, we all know mm. in our own personal experience the daily battle against temptation and all kinds of, of attack. That's why Jesus says when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we should pray, deliver us from the evil one, because there is an evil one, there is an enemy. And really, it is only our tiny little bit of the Western world, just in the last you know, couple of hundred years, that has ever had this weird notion that there isn't a devil, that there isn't an evil realm. It, it's the vast majority of people alive today, and certainly they've ever lived, have known there is a God, mm. and has known that there is a, a reality of evil in our world. So Pete, I'm wondering if you can tell us what does spiritual warfare look like in your life? I, I think this worldview really became real to me um, when I was living in Hong Kong, working with a lady called Jackie Pullinger, and we were um, helping men who were addicted to heroin and um, coming out of triad gangs mm. to get free. And to be honest, the, the, the spiritual battle as well as the psychological and the physical one was just obvious. It was very, very real. Um, whenever the dragon boat races were going on, which you know some people present as just a nice bit of like tourism, um, but actually there's worship behind that, mm. we would see uh, more of the men hit problems, run away, you know, they were very vulnerable to spiritual attack and very sensitive to it. So to the extent that we would actually have to rotor on more staff when we knew that those seasons were coming because we knew that the spiritual attack would increase. Yeah. At the start, I was like, you kidding me? Because, you know, I'd grown up in kind of a leafy area of England and wasn't used to this worldview, which is the normative view in most of the world. I hear what you're saying, but couldn't that all just kind of be psychiatry? Mm -hmm. I mean, you are dealing with vulnerable people right. and weird stuff does happen. Yeah. And I do think we have to learn from psychiatry. It's a really important branch of medicine, obviously. And of course, to, to, to apply psychiatry doesn't in any way remove the spiritual realm. Mm. The spiritual realm and the physical, material, biological realm, they're, they're, they're integrated. Many of the top psychiatrists actually are Christians. So we must listen to psychiatry. It's really important. But we mustn't then think that that means that there isn't some kind of a spiritual realm as well. I think the spiritual is caught up in the psychological, in the physical, in the material world. But also we must make sure we have a biblical worldview. And it's interesting when we look at Jesus and his stance, which was so clear on spiritual warfare, that actually he wasn't just rehashing the cosmology of everybody in first century uh, Middle East. Actually, there would have been at least three different kind of groups 
who would have disagreed with him a little bit when he was speaking. Yeah. And he, he was coming in with his own view. So first of all, if you imagine Jesus speaking to a crowd, there'd have been a bunch of people who were Sadducees. And the Sadducees were kind of the sophisticated political, you know, maneuverers who distrusted anything that smacked of super spirituality. And like many people today, they, they didn't believe in angels, demons, life after death. They thought that stuff was primitive. OK, so <laughs> this is 2000 years ago. For them, the kingdom of God was primarily a socio-political reality. And so when it came to the Lord's Prayer, they'd probably have been pretty happy just to quit that last line, deliver us from the evil ones. Yeah. Like, we, we, we don't need that. God, that's God's business. And then secondly, there would have been the wild-eyed, hairy Essenes who kind of camped out in the wilderness and prayed a lot and sought God. These guys were the opposite of the Sadducees. They were like, everything was kind of super spiritual for them. And where the Sadducees tended to minimize spiritual warfare, the Essenes wallowed in it. Where the Sadducees might have preferred to get rid of that last line of the Lord's Prayer, I think the Essenes probably would have liked to have just had nothing but it, deliver us from the evil one, because everything was about that battle. Nothing mattered more to them. And then as well as the Sadducees and the Essenes, you had, of course, the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were like the middle ground. So they believed in angels and demons and heaven and hell and stuff. But they thought that the way that you overcame those uh, things, the way you overcame the enemy, Satan, was to live a radically righteous and holy life and follow all these rules. And so they didn't go out to the wilderness. They weren't ascetic like the Essenes in that sense. And neither did they get so involved in the viper's nest of political intrigue like, um, like the Sadducees. What they did is they had this list of 613 rules oh that you goodness. had to obey in order to overcome the evil one. So they'd have been happy to have deliver us from the evil one at the end of the Lord's Prayer because they knew the, these 613 rules, that's what gets the job done. Mm. The reason I say this is because I think most people fall into one of these three categories. Mm. And they are caricatures. But maybe some people watching this, they naturally veer more to the kind of Sadducee view, where maybe they're finding this session already a little bit strange, a little mm -hmm. bit super spiritual. They'd prefer to be talking about psychology or sociology or social justice or political engagement or cultural credibility, you know, just all that kind of sensible stuff. Um, and then there, there are probably others who are watching this who are naturally a bit more like the Essenes. Mm. So they would generally prefer to say, um, pray about a problem than to, you know, go to see a doctor or write to a politician about it. And then there are probably others, and no one wants to be like the Pharisees, right? But th their worldview on this issue may be a little bit more like where they recognize the reality of spiritual warfare. Uh, but they, they would want to say, don't get too carried away with this stuff because mm. uh, we want to we stay focused on the less controversial stuff such as Bible study and, and personal holiness. And the interesting thing is Jesus steps into the room with those three viewpoints and actually he challenges all three of them. And so I, I feel like a life that is modelled on Jesus Christ and rooted in a biblical worldview combines a sober recognition of the reality of spiritual warfare, which we're talking about today, but also just an earthy dose of good humor and common sense. So really then we should take Jesus' advice and kind of chill out about all of this. Yeah, I mean, taking Jesus' advice is generally quite a, a good thing to do yeah. <laughs> in my experience. Um, it's important to get the balance right, isn't it? I think that's what I'm trying to say. I've just always loved uh, what C.S. Lewis, you know, the author mm -hmm. of Narnia, uh, what he says, and he wrote a book about spiritual warfare called The Screwtape Letters. Such a great book. It's stunning. And it's funny and it's relevant and profound. And C.S. Lewis uh, says this, there are two equal but opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve their existence and the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. So we need to recognize the reality of spiritual warfare, but we also need to make sure that we keep our focus on Jesus. Right. I've always loved that story about the great preacher Smith Wigglesworth. And he apparently woke in the night one time. He saw Satan manifesting in all his terror 
Wigglesworth took one look at him and said, oh, it's only you, and went back to sleep. <laughs> Imagine how depressing that must be for Satan. I love it because he's real about Satan, but he's not obsessively impressed right. by anything. So um, let's take a look at the Bible. Let's look at the, the, the classic passage, Ephesians chapter 6, because there are such keys in here uh, for us as we seek to do spiritual warfare. So let's look at this, Ephesians uh, chapter 6. And we're going to read uh, from verse 11. The Apostle Paul says, Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then. And so most of the, the armour that we are given is to help us defend ourselves. It's to stand. This passage says again and again, stand firm, stand firm, stand. So it's not so much about taking the fight to the enemy, but more about just not giving ground. I've heard people say that everything except the sword is defensive. Yeah, you've got the sword of the spirit is absolutely pretty uh, aggressive. I think we can agree. <laughs> this is an absolute yes. beauty here. Look at that. This is, this is, by the way, this is the actual type of sword Paul would have been referring to. It's the gladius from ah. which we get the word gladiator. And then also there are the shoes of the gospel. And I would say that's also part of our offensive mm. armour because here's a good pair of running shoes. They've had a bit of use in their time. And... Uh, you know, the image was that carriers of the good news of a military victory would run uh, w w with that good news and proclaim it to cities. You're free. We've won. You know, the emperor has won. And the greatest spiritual breakthrough you can ever see, the greatest bit of spiritual warfare you can ever do is to preach the good news of Jesus and lead someone into a living relationship with him. The, the great um, Swiss theologian Karl Barth talks quite a bit about prayer and spiritual warfare. And you've got to take Barth really seriously because Pope Pius XII said that Karl Barth was probably the greatest theologian since Thomas Aquinas. So this guy really knows his stuff. I'm not just rocking out some random theologian. This is Karl Barth here. And he says this about spiritual warfare. It's such an amazing quote. I've got it written out in my journal. But listen to this. Karl Barth, in Christian prayer we find ourselves at the very seat of government, at the very heart of the mystery and purpose of all the currents. Mm. This, is, this is a much bigger view of prayer than just, please give me a new bicycle. This is saying that in prayer, you take authority, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're partnering with God in order to exercise his authority and to advance his kingdom. But hasn't Jesus already won? Like, hasn't Satan been right. defeated? So why pray? Right. Absolutely. Jesus on the cross overcame Satan. He won the victory. There was that great cry, it is finished. Like the battle is finished. And so with his death and his resurrection, Satan was defeated. Yet he hasn't yet been destroyed. If you read the New Testament, you mm -hmm. read right up to the book of Revelation, it's like he's in his death throes. And so when we pray for God's kingdom to come, it's because it's not automatic that the kingdom comes. We have to pray it in. It's not just going to happen regardless of our prayers. We have to live it in as well as pray it in. So when we pray, we pray from a place of, of victory and of joy, not from a place of despair and despondency. And we do that because we know that the battle has been won. As you said, Jesus has won the victory. And so we are praying uh, from a place of victory. We are wielding the word of God, knowing the word of God overcomes. We are running with the shoes of the gospel, knowing that the victory has been won on the cross. So look, that's an amazing assurance, right? That all shall yeah. be well. But the reality is that we're surrounded by suffering yeah. and by manifest evil and by problems. So how do we make sense of that? We all live our lives between being saved 
the death and resurrection of Jesus and the day when he will return and there'll be no more sin and sickness and suffering and manifest evil in the world. Mm. And so we're praying, we're longing, we're preaching the gospel in this context of this gap between the darkness and the light, the resurrection and the return uh, of Jesus. So to use that image then, how do we actually, in this intervening period of history, how do we practice spiritual warfare? So first of all, in spiritual warfare, we've got to pray it. We've actually got to you know, pray in the victory of Jesus because it, it's not automatically applied. And you know, there's a lovely example of this in the Old Testament where Daniel is reading the word of God He's reading the book of Jeremiah and he has this like revelation that the people of Israel aren't meant to be in captivity, that God has a different purpose for them. And so he, he's pulled into that tension. Right. He's like, we've got to get out of this. We're not meant to be in this place. So he begins to pray and fast for 21 days, we're mm. told. He fasted food and he, it's fascinating. He, it says he also fasted body lotion. Okay. Which I'm, I don't know. I reckon I've been at some Christian meetings where there definitely some people fasting body lotion. <laughs> and so he's there denying himself and seeking God, and he keeps praying like we often have to, just persevering in prayer because he realizes God wants one thing; it's not happening. I'm going to pull in the the will of God, the purpose of God, the word of God. Mm. He's he's fighting with the sword of the spirit, and an angel appears to him and says. I heard you on day one, mm. but it's taken me 21 days because I have been resisted and fighting the Prince of Persia. Okay, so what is this? Well, remember where we started, Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul says, our battle's not against flesh and blood, but it's against right. principalities and powers. Princes, principalities over regions, areas like Persia. So here we have a little insight between the sort of angelic realm and the warfare that's going on as we pray. And so often why we have to persevere in prayer, uh, because God hears us the moment we ask, day one. Day one. But there's a battle that's going on for the will of God to, to kick in. But if we just pray it and we don't actually practice it, then it's just a nonsense. We have to live this stuff out as well. There's no point in praying for God's victory if we don't demonstrate it with the way we're living our lives. Right. Um, I've got this friend, a mentor, Floyd McClung, and he taught me a lot about this stuff. He, for a long time, lived in the red light district of Amsterdam, and he planted a church which was in between a Satanist church on one side and a pornographic bookstore wow. on the other. And he said to his guys, look, as well as uh, praying in spiritual warfare, because there's obviously a lot of darkness around, we're going to practice it. We're going to live it. We're going to live in a different alternative spirituality, as it were. And so with all the immorality that was going on one side, sexually, he said, we are going to live with transparency and integrity and accountability. We're going to live different. Wow. And then with literally with Satan being worshipped on the other side, he said, we're just going to worship Jesus like mad as Lord. And so they lived by a different set of values in that place. And within a few years, the pornographic bookstore had shut down and the Satanist church had burnt down. Mm. There's just victory when, as well as praying in the victory of God, we practice it, we live it out. And one of the best things you can do in spiritual warfare is try and work out what's the thing the enemy's doing and what's his strategy. And then by discerning the spirits that are at work in your workplace or where there are strongholds in your city, then choose to live in the equal but opposite spirit. So for example, um, if there's loads of greed around, all around you, live with greater generosity. Mm. If, if, if there's masses of arrogance, live with greater humility, because otherwise the enemy will start to tempt you with those very things, but by doing the opposite, you're proving that Jesus has overcome them, right? So we prayed it, yep. we practiced it, yep. what's next? You gotta preach it. Because as well as you know, praying our spiritual warfare, and as well as living out the equal but opposite spirit, at some point we just gotta tell people, mm -hmm. not about Satan, 
about Jesus. Right. Right. We've, we, we've got to proclaim the gospel. We've got to, you know, put on the shoes of the gospel and declare the victory of Jesus. And the greatest spiritual breakthrough you will ever see, the greatest um, breakthrough in spiritual warfare is when someone gives their life to Jesus Christ. When someone becomes a Christian, that is the ultimate victory, the ultimate foretaste of the day when every knee will bow mm. and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and his resurrection will have turned into his return. There'll be no more sin or sickness or suffering anymore and the new heaven and the new earth will have begun. That You get like a foretaste of that every time someone gives their life to Christ. So you've got to pray it, you've got to practice it, but it's really important we also preach yeah. the victory of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. So Pete, this is it. This is the final session of the prayer course. I, I, I can hardly believe it. I have learned so much over this course. And right now I'm going to challenge you. Uh-oh. Ready? Okay. <laughs> Give us a summary of what we've learned over the course. Oh, come on. That's a nightmare. Okay. The easiest way of doing this is going to be to walk through the Lord's Prayer. That's been our structure, right? Right. So, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we start our prayers with adoration, mm. right? With, with not bringing our shopping list to God, but actually just enjoying his presence. Uh, your kingdom come. So then we, we've thought about intercession. Yeah. How do we take hold of the rule and reign of, of Christ and bring that into real situations through partnership with him in prayer? And then there's your will be done. And we thought about unanswered prayer. We thought about Christ's great prayer of relinquishment in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's facing just the worst stuff imaginable. And he manages to pray, not my will, but your will be done. And I hope we, we were pretty honest about the pain and the cost of, of, of doing that. And then remember, it's on the earth as it is in heaven, mm. right? This is where we really think about, con uh, about contemplation. Right. That bit where we earth God's great uh, love in our own situations, our own lives. It's that prayer that's being and not doing. And, and so we, we focused on contemplative prayer, right? And then there was um, give us this day our daily bread. And we thought about petition, asking the father who loves to give good gifts to his kids uh, for our practical needs, that the simple act of asking in prayer. But we also thought about listening to God because we recognize that um, our daily bread isn't just physical bread, it's the word of God, right? Right. Uh, and then, of course, next in the Lord's Prayer, you've got forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now, People may have noticed that we haven't managed to cover that in this series. It's just because we couldn't cover everything. But in the, in the accompanying book, in How to Pray, there's a whole section on confession and reconciliation and the importance of right relationships at the heart of our prayer lives. So if that's something people want to find out more about, and I'd encourage them to do so, it's really worth looking at the book. And then, of course, the Lord's Prayer culminates in Deliver Us from evil and we've thought today about spiritual warfare and then that's kind of where Jesus left it but the early church added this end bit I think just to bring it full circle where we we often pray uh, for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever and so this is where having begun with adoration our father in heaven hallowed be your name the whole thing comes full circle mm. and ends with adoration again with that anticipation of the day when we won't have to pray your kingdom come anymore because the kingdom will have come we won't have to pray your will be done because his will will be being done on earth we won't be having to pray give us this day our daily bread because there'll be no more hunger there'll be no yeah. more injustice and, and and so in a way the lord's prayer will be fulfilled in the return of jesus and so we culminate the whole thing with this big fat amen, amen. to that <laughs> amen so that's it. You did it. You summarized it yeah, up. Man, Good job. I, that was two minutes. Why did we need eight sessions? <laughs> we could have just done this in five minutes. So that's it. That is it. We hope that you have enjoyed the prayer course and that you found it helpful. If you want to go deeper, do get a hold of the book, How to Pray, A Simple Guide for Normal People. And make sure you head over to prayercourse.org, which is loaded with tons of materials, including the tool shed that are gonna help you in your prayer life. Pete's also written a bunch of other amazing books, so make sure you check those out too. 
And do let us have your feedback by tweeting comments to us about the course using the hashtag prayer course. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember that this is just the start of the journey. And Pete, I think there wouldn't be a better way to start than to pray. So would you pray for us? Sure. Yeah, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord Jesus, we did start this course saying, would you teach us to pray? And thank you that you have been teaching us. You've been answering that prayer. Thank you that you are drawing each one of us into a closer relationship with you. Teach us to hear your voice. Teach us to be faithful, even when it's difficult. And Lord, more than anything, we long to see your kingdom come in our world, your hope and your love, your forgiveness, your redemption in all the brokenness of our world. And we long to live for your glory. Let your kingdom come in our lives and in our families, in our churches, let our churches be houses of prayer for the nation. And ultimately, let your kingdom come in this world. Amen. Amen. Truth has set us free.